Okay, sisters, and brothers, comrades, and friends, welcome to the 16th annual Socialist Action International Educational Conference, Fight Imperialism. We acknowledge that this gathering takes place on the unceded territories of the Mississauga of the New Credit, the Wendat and Austin Oshani people. We do more than honor the First Nations. We join in the fight for justice, recognizing that there can be no real reconciliation without restitution, which entails seizing the assist assets of the big resource corporations and returning them to the commons. Around the world, working people are demanding an end to austerity and war, an end to destruction of the environment, an end to big business rule. The public sector is under relentless attack. Job security is disappearing. The rulers have money for war in Asia, Africa, and Latin America, but not for clean water in indigenous communities. Same. They have wads of cash to rebuild the Notre Dame Cathedral, but not to house the homeless. Today the world is teetering on the brink of climate catastrophe and nuclear holocaust. The new Cold War is getting hotter. Its front line stretches from the Baltic Sea to the Persian Gulf, from Venezuela to Palestine. Ironically, the cradle of civilization could become the graveyard of humanity if the Cold War goes nuclear. We know that 1% of the global population controls over 50% of the world's wealth. In the face of growing inequality and poverty, Canadian bank and mining CEO rewards himself with multi-million dollar salaries. We have a severe housing crisis. Robots are replacing workers. Cops get away with murdering black, brown, and mentally ill people. We are inundated by a steady stream of lies oh, sorry. from our saccharine Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau. On climate change, indigenous rights, electoral reform, taxation, civil liberties, and military spending, is, is the Harper agenda behind a cloud of cannabis smoke. <laughs> On matters of imperialism, war, pipelines, and trade, Trudeau has been trumped. So the working class is fighting back. We are inspired by the ongoing struggle of the Yellow Vest movement in France and by recent victories of teachers across the USA, by the campaign to raise the minimum wage and by the actions of young workers fighting for job security and a living wage. We draw inspiration from Greta Thunberg, the young Swedish ecologist, from Idle No More, and from Black Lives Matter. We say it's time that working people reject labor concessions and remove those officials who keep the capitalist system going. We say it's time to rise up, time to break the chains that bind us to a system that specializes in repression, war, environmental disaster, and untold suffering. In the words of solidarity forever, sisters and brothers, let's bring to birth a new world from the ashes of Dio. My name is Elizabeth Weiss, and I'm a retired member of the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, Federal Treasurer of the NDP Socialist Caucus, and a leading member of, of Socialist Action, and your chair for this conference. Currently, we are celebrating the 25th anniversary of the founding of Socialist Action in Canada. SA is committed to grassroots democracy and a united front in action. You can see our work in the NDP Socialist Caucus, the Workers' Action Movement, in the unions and campaigns of solidarity with Venezuela and Cuba, and in the fight against Thug Ford. SA initiated the Cross Country Day of Action for Palestinian Rights, held on Saturday, May the 18th. We are proud of our contribution to fostering pan Canadian action for boycotts, divestment, sanctions against the Zionist apartheid state. The right wing in the U.S. and Canada is trying to deprive women of the rights to choose on abortion. We say to hell with that. We're never going back. A woman's right to, never going back. A woman's right to choose is here to stay. If you want to change the world now, it's time to get directly involved. We warmly invite you to join Socialist Action. We are delighted to have as co-sponsors our sister parties in the United States, Socialist Action USA in France, the new anti-capitalist party in Greece, uh, OKDE, and in Mexico, the Social Socialist Unity League, LUS. We are thrilled to have present with us this weekend's comrades from our sister party in the United States and from Left Voice and also from Costa Rica. 
I hope you enjoyed this session and the entire conference. Please take the opportunity to visit our display table, buy some great literature, subscribe to our monthly newspaper, Socialist Action, the best publication of its kind in North America. If at any time during the conference you decide you would like to join SA, please approach one of our leading members. And now, are you ready to listen? Yeah. Are you ready to discuss? Yeah. Are you ready to have a good time? So let's start Socialism 2019. So we're going to begin with an inspiring spoken word performance by our great friend and comrade, Socialist Hip Hop Mohammed Ali. Woo! Check, check. Everybody hear me? Yeah. See, this way I'm on the mic. I can hear y'all talking to each other, so you gotta pay attention. Get okay, kidding. <laughs> that joke usually goes off way better, but okay. my name is Muhammad Ali, and i performed here many times uh, at many, many socialist action events, so I thought I would change it up and do a little piece that you probably, hopefully, haven't heard before. Uh, this one right here um, is called uh, Dreams, and it goes a little something like this. When Michelle was 23, she was picking up the pieces, the life that she lived, all of a sudden ceases, Jesus. Pray you never feel that pain. Husband walked, left her kids, she's starting over again, but she gained a new appreciation. Two years later, George Brown, pediatric graduation. She reset the fragments are new. Her ex called her up, she said, I'm good, now and you. As a youngin for Michelle, family was first. Now that she has her own, she's dedicated to hers and to your kids. She's more than a nurse. She's an arm around the shoulder when the therapy hurts. Her daughter's smiling face is a cue that she's back home from playing the role of the community backbone. You can see it in her eyes, the daughter closed shopping. A couple years ago, she didn't have the option. You may not know her personally, but she's the faceless person you see, facing lunacy of bureaucrats who often enough making promises like we'll never have your hospitals touched. The Michelles of the world, the ones who had it so rough, are the first ones to say that enough is enough. What a shame it would be if some government cuts brought it back to where she started 600 a month. What a shame it would be if some government cuts brought it back to where she started 600 a month. So, uh, most folks know, a few months ago, I released an album, Labor of Love, it's a workers' rights-themed uh, uh, project. Um, I have uh, some download cards here. It says the full album on the back, but it's actually only a sample of two songs. I'm um, probably going to just pass them off to Julius when I head out. And if you want uh, a sample of the album, Labor of Love, uh, with two free downloads, you can get it from Julius. If not, you can listen for free on Spotify or iTunes, or you can hit me up on social media if you want to buy a copy of the album at Socialist Hip Hop. Um, and with that, I'm going to do a piece um, off the album. This one right here needs a bit of crowd participation. Can we do that? Yes. Yeah. Right on. All right. I think y'all may know this song, but may not have heard this rendition. We the workers built this land, blood, sweat, and tears. The ones who toil the soil, the ones who grind the gears. It is we who plow the prairies under the summer sun. Walk a life of work, but the journey's never done. Built the cities where we live, connected bricks to mortar. The strength of one is feeble, so shoulder touch shoulder. The burden gets shouldered. With certain we soldier, nine to five, side by side, sipping on Folgers. But our hands hold a power greater than the house of gold, greater than the might of armies magnified a thousand fold, bringing forth a new world from the ashes of the old. The union is a merger of the workers, brave and bold. United cells between the brain and the bronze, solidarity forever, till your breath is gone. All went together. Their sister brother sing the song. The union, yes, the union. The union makes us strong. When I say union, y'all say strong. Union, strong. Union, strong. When I say socialist, y'all say hip hop. Socialist, hip hop. Socialist, hip hop. When I say socialist, y'all say action. Socialist, action. Socialist, action. When I say socialist, y'all say hip hop. Socialist, hip hop. Socialist, hip hop. We used to work nine to five and say the time flew by. Now we fighting over scraps like kitchen fruit flies. Two jobs. Plus school, still too little. Minimum wage raised, but my rent got tripled. My boss at the cottage talking about austerity, launching Amos Coca chairs. He ain't trying to share with me. Say the economic action plan's an actual scam. After hand, the factory workers find their access banned. Turn this to a war between workers, bosses. Makes no sense. It just furthers losses. Now I really see how much mergers costing. Say we get fired? No, not costing. United cells between the brain and the bronze. Solidarity forever till your breath is gone. 
all in together. Sister brother, sing the song. The union, yes, the union. Union makes us strong. When I say union, y'all say strong. Union. Strong. Union. Strong. When I say socialist, y'all say hip-hop. Socialist. Hip-hop. Socialist. Hip-hop. When, when I say socialist, y'all say action. Socialist. Action. Socialist. Action. When I say socialist, y'all say hip-hop. Socialist. Hip-hop. Socialist. Hip-hop. All I know for sure, this wage in my pocket, always best protected by my trade union office. Real leaders, boots to the pavement, the puppet politicians, no longer complacent, break stale mates. Be the change agent, rise to occasion, go and make a statement. We need change now, that's how we won the weekend. No dope a hope to hold the fort for this is not the season. Life's no fairy tale, no night to slay the dragon. Your sword's a picket sign, it's time for strike action. We need to strike with words and fight for reckless rights and freedom. That real revolutionary, I write to be one. Unite ourselves between the brain and the bronze, solidarity forever. Till your breath is gone, all in together, sister, brother, sing the song. The union, yes, the union. The union makes us strong. One last piece to you. I, I know it's a, it's a packed evening today at a, at a full conference, and I have one last piece. But before that, I just want to give uh, a very, very sincere and, and a big shout out uh, to Sid Ryan. Um, uh, when Sid. Um, was a labor leader. Um, yeah, 100%. Uh, you know, the work that Sid has done, my first music video that I ever shot uh, was at the uh, OFL rally for $15 minimum wage at Young and Dundas. Um, so, you know, that, that was huge for me. My first chance to perform at a major rally. Um, also, the first time I ever uh, got brought out to the OFL convention, Sid commissioned me uh, to do a theme song highlighting, in music form, some of the main points of his speech. Uh, he's been an amazing leader like we all know, but also very integral because I wrote the Workers' Rights Project, Labor of Love, you know, mostly over the time uh, where, where Sid was leading the OFL. So, you know, going to London, going to Hamilton, um, you know, for, for the strike actions, uh, for, for, you know, for all, all the stuff that was happening, all the fight backs, you know, I was soaking in stories, talking to folks and, you know, participating in it, and a lot of that was being led by, by Sid. So, uh, I don't think Sid knows it, but he, his work really helped shape my Labor of Love album. <laughs> and with that, I'm going to finish with a piece um, I did last year. Uh, I, I think Sid's really going to like this one. I don't think you've heard it before, uh, but I think it's right up your alley, my brother. Democracy Now, Muhammad Ali, the socialist vocalist at Socialist Hip Hop. You're looking for me on Spotify. It's Muhammad Ali. Would you send your future son out to Ferguson? Would you see the front line or be the first to run? Would you still rally if the battle won't be won? Ferguson, Ferguson, this goes out to Ferguson. Cause they got me putting red up on my visa. Sky is the limit, they don't wanna see us reach it. They wanna keep us down, they wanna keep it secret. The people, united. Never be All the way at the top, they don't see it. Champagne by the leaders, all my leaders, elitist. I'm sick of broken treaties. I'm sick of how they treat us. The people, united. Never be the power of the people stronger than people in power. The power by the people, we put those people in power. Hours turn to days, days into decades. Work eight to six, then raise my kid, I'm living in a debt age. They paid paradise, put up a parking lot. Joni Mitchell never lied, still the block is hot. Pipelines from the barren sea, pipes where the bear should be. We need solidarity, need solid air to breathe. Won't weep if we reap what we sowed. We believe giving each equal peace, that's the goal. We don't steal, we don't scheme. They see us as drones, machines, worker bees for a queen on the throne. They see no play on no game, on no board. When the stakes is your life, you take him what's yours. Money, power, respect, what my people call it. I mean, we making all this money, they just keeping all it. Money, power, respect. Money, power, respect. Money, power, respect. They just keeping all in. Cause they got me putting rent up on my visa. Sky is the limit. They don't want to see us reach it. They want to keep us down. They want to keep it secret. The people, united. Never be defeated. All the way at the top, they don't see it. Champagne by the leaders, all my leaders, elitists. I'm sick of broken treaties. I'm sick of how they treat us. The people, united. Never be defeated. First is for my fam. Then it's for my fans. My people at the jam, those who still give a damn. 
You mathematics, we the millions, we the masses, we the wonder, we outnumber millionaires across the planet. We parse poetics, it ain't even positive. We politic in places, they ain't talking politics. Park benches, coffee shops, street corners, barber shops. Real life, it's really life. Like I really hate my boss. Muhammad too political, too hypocritical. Like keep it going, but I'm out of syllables. Let them stay on these soap boxes. This ain't a soap opera. Wish they had a goal that wasn't pro soccer. Fat cats getting rich. We hungry, we marving. We starve as artists. We say you are what you eat, but really, though, you are what you think, because they got me putting rent up on my visa. Sky is the limit. They don't want to see us reach it. They want to keep us down. They want to keep it secret. The people, united, will never be defeated. All the way at the top, they don't see it. Champagne by the leaders, my leaders, elitist. I'm sick of broken treaties. I'm sick of how they treat us. The people, united, will never be defeated. 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 Make some noise, socialist action. Woo! Sure I go one foot south, we have everybody just messed up in the air. All you messed up with everybody. Muhammad Ali, the socialist vocalist, peace, love, solidarity. Thank you so much, Cameron. And just remember, at, the, at noon hour on Saturday, before our session starts on the Winnipeg General Strike, uh, Comrade Moab will be back again. And also at that time, there will be a poem read by Barry Wiseletter on the strike itself and the playing of a new song about the Winnipeg uh, strike way back when. Okay, so that's going to happen on Saturday before we start that session. Okay, so without further ado, thanks, Comrade Moab. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, we will now uh, go to our panel of speakers. And we have four, as you can see, and the speakers will speak in this order. Our first speaker will be Dahlia al Kadra, who was born in Safad in the north of Palestine. She is a member of the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid and the Oakville Palestine Rights Association. Both groups are a part of the Canadian BDS Coalition, which sponsored the Cross Country Day of Action for Palestine on May the 18th. Our second speaker, will be Barry Wiseletter for 20 years, was the president of the Toronto Substitute Teachers and now continues to fight for democracy on OSSTF. A former OPSU executive board member, Barry is chair of the NDP Socialist Caucus on the editorial board of Turnleft and is the SC candidate for vice president of the Ontario NDP at the upcoming convention in Abington uh, in mid-June. Our, our third speaker will be uh, Karen Rodman, is a founder and executive director of Just Peace Advocates, a non-for-profit non Just Trade, Canadian-based organization. She provided executive leadership for 30 years in government, public, and program policy. Karen is an ordained United Church of Canada minister and a national coordinator of the Canadian BDS Coalition. And our fourth speaker will be Dimitri Lascaris, he is a Canadian lawyer, journalist, and activist. He is a frequent advocate for human rights of Palestine. In 2012, Lacaris was named by Canadian Lawyer Magazine as one of Canada's 25 most influential lawyers. He is a correspondent and board member of the Real News Network and a board member of Canadians for Justice and Peace in the Middle East. He ran for the Green Party of Canada in Canada's 2015 federal elections in the riding of London West and served as Justice Critic on the GPC Shadow Cabinet. So without further ado, we will start off with the uh, sister. We each have 15 minutes. I will, I, I will give you a, a, a three minute and a one minute. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Dali Al Khadra, Al Khadra, and I'm originally from Safad. I wasn't born there, but uh, I originally go from Safad itself. And just to give you a small introduction about uh, Palestine, uh, Palestine was a country that was occupied in the 1948 and been colonized. Sorry, volume. sorry, the volume. Oh. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Close to the mic. Close to the mic. Okay. So. Palestine as a country was occupied in the 1948. A uh, new state has been established, which is Israel. And since that time, 
the continuous process of just eliminating any Palestinian factor in, this, in the area itself has been ongoing. Uh, once the State of Israel were created, uh, the previous Prime Minister, Golda Meir, was asked if she has any fear of a future generation of Palestinians coming to ask for the land. And she said that the first generation of the Nakba will die, and that eventually there will be no one asking. Today, 71 years after all of that Nakba, we're still here. The struggle is still there. The last couple of years, we can see there's been international interest. Uh, there has been more international solidarity movement, uh, more international organization, activists from different backgrounds, Europeans, North American, Australian, African, Asians, as Arabs, going to Palestine to show their solidarity with the Palestinian people. Previously, Israel has always mentioned the fact that the Palestinian cause is a Palestinian issue. It is only our concern. It's only a Palestinian concern. But in the last 20 years with the globalization and all of the so social media, the things has changed. It has been shifted. There's international concerns about us. And there's international concern about the Palestinians inside mostly Palestine. The way that they have been shuttled, shut down, the way that they have been, the identity has been raised. So talking about for example, the changes, talking about the things that has been notable. There has, let's talk about the BDS movement, the boycott, divestment, sanction. I'm talking about fact about that, just because when it first started, the Israelis said that it will be no concern of them. It will be nothing. It doesn't consider them as a threat. They don't see anything coming from it. Today, almost what, 14 years after the establishment of that movement, more victories has been supported by the BDS. We can see that on a daily basis. I'm just going to give you a couple of those victories in 2018, mm -hmm. just to talk about what's the threats that has been continuously, the one that, the thing that Israel said that it is not their concern. Taking into consideration that last year they have established a lobby, lobby for the anti-BDS. They have supported that lobby with $52 million. This is a lobby that they say that for a movement that doesn't concern them, for a movement that doesn't cause them any threat. Mm -hmm. So talking about, first initially, Airbnb decided that it would no longer profit from the most illegal Israel settlements on stolen, sorry. Airbnb stated that they will no longer profit from the most illegal Israel settlements on stolen Palestinian land. Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib made history by becoming the first sitting US members of Congress to publicly endorse BDS. Mobilization across the world convinced Argentina national football team to withdraw from their participation in the games. Celebrity singers like Lana Del Grey became one of the 19th artists to withdraw from the Israeli Meteor Festival. Chile Congress overwhelmingly voted to ban products from illegal settlements built on stolen land. Major organizations from the Indian Women Movement, representing 10 million women, endorsed the BTS movement. Amnesty International calls for an armed embargo on Israel. The UK Labour Party recently voted to freeze arms sales to Israel. In Ireland, a minister of the state and 50 Irish lawmakers called for Ireland to stop arming Israel. Ireland became the first European capital to endorse BDS for Palestinian rights. Parliament from Spain, Portugal took a stand for Palestinian rights and de-announced Israel war crimes and racist Jewish nation state law. 40 national International Jewish Social Studies, uh, sorry, social justice organizations recognize that the BDS movement of Palestine rights has a proven commitment to fighting anti-Semitism and all forms of racism and bigotry. And they have condemned attempts to stifle criticism of Israel policies. Adidas stopped sponsoring the Israel Football Association. Canadian Federation of Students, representing more than 500,000 students, just voted their annual general meeting to back BDS movement. So, with all of those victories that we can see, if they are not scared, then the question would be, why are they supporting the anti-BDS lobby? Why do they keep on financing it? Why do they keep on stopping all of the BDS activities around the world? The answer for that would be that it is working. We have more people talking about this than ever, like even 20 years ago, wherever you can go in the world. 20 years ago, it was maybe, yes, the Palestinian was only a Palestinian struggle, but now, it is international. Humanitarians from all over the world collaborate every year. The Freedom Flotilla of Gaza, the one that goes every year, being stopped in the international water, 
and then every year they do the same thing again and again and again. So there's something definitely working here, and I think we're on the right track. Thank you very much all. How y'all doing? Good. Thank you very much for coming to this uh, exciting discussion because it's all about change, about new things happening. On Saturday, May the 18th, the first Pan-Canadian Day of Action for Palestinian Rights took place. In Toronto, close to 500 people rallied and marched to demand justice for the Palestinian people. Shortly after 2 o'clock, that day, the gathering at Young and Dundas heard the poetry of Mahmoud Darwish, listened to music, then speeches from a number of leading activists. An attempt by a dozen flag-waving Zionists to infiltrate and disrupt the event was repulsed by loud, loud chanting and the presence of a stalwart corps of marshals. Speakers at the rally included Hamam Farah, newly elected to the executive board of the Palestinian Canadian Community Center. Emily Green of the Independent Jewish Voices, Philippe Nagata of the Canadian Federation of Students, Zafar Bangash of the Canadian Council for Justice and Peace, Wallace Al-Safi from Solidarity for Palestinian Human Rights at McMaster University, Ali Mala, a veteran union activist and member of the Al-Quds Committee, uh, this writer on behalf of Socialist Action, and Rabbi David Feldman of Neturai Karta International, whose written statement I read aloud at his request due to his strict observance of the Sabbath, and MC Lena Assi of McMaster University, SPHR, did a, did a brilliant job of chairing and leading chants en route. I mention those names so you get a glimpse of the scope of the united front that we built, which is just a glimpse of what is possible. The Day of Action, sponsored by the Canadian BDS Coalition, took place in cities from Atlantic to the Pacific, Demands included boycott, divestment, and sanctions against the Israeli state and economy. End the occupation, tear down the apartheid wall, lift the siege of Gaza, and establish the right of all Palestinian refugees to return home. The Toronto crowd grew as it marched slowly north, and I do mean slowly north, on Young Street to Bloor, the site of an office tower that houses the Israeli consulate. There, we occupied Canada's busiest intersection for over 45 minutes to hear speakers and to engage in loud chanting. Please take note, we did not apply for a parade permit. We did not ask police permission to rally. In fact, they closed off, Bravo. They closed off lanes of traffic and intersections, including at the final rally site. They cooperated with our marshals. They almost subordinated themselves to our marshals while the BDS coalition members distributed information to passers-by all afternoon. The array of red flags and colorful banners along with the contingent of anti-Zionist Jewish rabbis was a sight to behold. It was the first time that proponents of Palestine solidarity seized that famous crossroad and held it long enough to present a democratic anti-imperialist narrative for the city and the world to witness through social media. How could this happen, especially at a time when the authorities at all levels are trying to vilify, even to outlaw BDS, to ban the Al-Quds march, and to stop anti-Zionist free speech? Well, part of the answer is this. Public opinion in Canada now backs sanctions against the Zionist state. That is why Socialist Action proposes that there be an annual cross-country day of action and that Palestine solidarity work be stepped up on a year-round basis. It is important for us to grasp the growing convergence of anti-imperialist struggles, to see the fissures in the world system of domination, and to comprehend our tasks as working people from the Middle East to Latin America to Africa to Asia. As I said to the May 18 rally, the eyes of the world are on Palestine and Venezuela. Why? Because of their proximity to vast reserves of oil. The corporate energy giants want to control the resources of the world. They try to crush any nation that stands in their way. 
Recently, we saw the examples of this behavior when Washington seized the embassy of Venezuela in the U.S. capital, and earlier when it moved the U.S. embassy to Jerusalem, indicating that the Zionist occupation will be permanent. To that we say, no, 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 imperialist hands off Venezuela, free, free Palestine. The Palestinian people are in the forefront of resistance to world imperialism. They did not choose this role. It was thrust upon them. When the Ottoman Empire collapsed in the early 20th century, the Western powers carved up the Middle East, just as they did Africa and Asia earlier. Never forget that it was Winston Churchill, as Britain's war minister from 1919 to 1921, who authorized dropping poisonous mustard gas on the population of Iraq. In the face of rebellion by the Arab masses across the whole region, the imperial masters decided to sponsor a military fortress in the region. They exploited the survivors of the Nazi Holocaust for their greedy goals. But the fact remains, Israel is a colonial settler state. It is an outpost of imperialism in the Arab East. You know, Zionism began as an extreme bourgeois nationalist minority movement. It ran completely counter to the strong socialist and internationalist tradition of Jews across the diaspora. Theodore Herzl, a non-religious Jew and founder of Zionism, gained sponsors in France, Britain, even Tsarist Russia. And later, Canada, the USA, and Christian Zionists joined the project. Even the Stalinist-ruled USSR voted at the United Nations in 1948 for the partition of Palestine that led to the establishment of Israel. Why did the Stalinists do this? They did it because they thought that the Israeli Communist Party, then called the Maki Party, could be part of the government in the new state. The Palestinian people were sacrificed by Stalinism on the altar of bourgeois electoral expediency. Looking at the bigger picture, the Zionist state itself was founded on a big lie the pa that Palestine was a land without people for a people without land. But the Palestinian people are here today to refute this lie. I speak for Socialist Action as its federal secretary. Socialist Action is part of the World Trotskyist Movement. Our movement opposed the creation of the Zionist state 71 years ago. We oppose the so-called two-state solution, which is just a cruel cover for racism and ethnic cleansing. The truth is, there is no solution to the Jewish question under capitalism. The only solution is world socialist revolution. Leon Trotsky predicted in the 1930s that a Jewish state would be a death trap for the Jews. The odious actions of the Zionist state fuel Jew hatred. Through world revolution, though world revolution may seem beyond reach, world capitalism is clearly a prescription for racism, war, and climate catastrophe that threatens the demise of civilization. The best hope for humanity is a majority self-empowerment, the revolutionary road forward. The precondition for that is firm and undying support for national liberation struggles, which only the working class and poor farmers can lead all the way to victory. That means no reliance on bourgeois parties or on the capitalist state or on any imperialist military alliances like NATO. This is a cornerstone of Trotsky's strategy which is summed up in two words, permanent revolution. Oppressed nations the world over, from Kurdistan to Ireland to the Philippines, have long eaten the bitter fruit of betrayal after their aspirations to national liberation have been subordinated and betrayed in favor of the preservation of capitalist rule. SA is proud to have initiated, through the Canadian BDS coalition, the first cross-country day of action for Palestinian rights. It all began with a discussion in our leadership last November, followed by the adoption of the idea by the coalition in December, and its confirmation in January, and then four more months of solid grassroots organizing with many wonderful people all across this country. But again, why now? Because over the past decade, public opinion across the Canadian state has shifted. A big majority, 66%, support sanctions against Israel. 66%. The majority recognize Israel is guilty of systemic oppression and war crimes 
according to a 2017 poll by ECOS commissioned by the CPJME. Here are some elements of that. Canadians believe overwhelmingly that sanctions are a reasonable way for Canada to censure countries violating international law and human rights. Given the UN Security Council's recent condemnation of illegal Israeli settlements on Palestinian territory, a strong majority of Canadians believe that government sanctions on Israel would be reasonable. In the context of Israel's ongoing violations of international law, a very strong majority of Canadians believe that the Palestinians' call for a boycott of Israel is reasonable. And finally, far more Canadians oppose than support Parliament's February 2016 decision to condemn individuals and groups who promote the Palestinian call for a boycott of Israel. Voters for four out of the five major political parties in Parliament favor sanctions. Among Liberal voters, it's 75 percent. Among NDP voters, it's 84 percent. Among Green Party members, it's 85 percent. And among Bloc Québécois voters, it's 94 percent. Even among Conservative voters, 30 percent say sanctions against Israel are reasonable. So why are the Zionists in a panic? It's clear. Because they have lost the battle for public opinion in this country. In the Jewish community, a remarkable change has occurred as well. In September 2018, a survey conducted by the polling firm ECOS, sponsored by Independent Jewish Voices and the United Jewish People's Order, found that among Jewish Canadians, this is, this is my, my folks, more than a third, 37%, have a negative opinion of the Israeli government. 37%. Almost equal proportions oppose, 45%, and support, 42%, the U.S. decision to recognize Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Almost a third, 30%, think that the Palestinian call for a boycott of Israel is reasonable, and 34% also oppose Parliament condemning those who endorse a boycott of Israel. Finally, almost one in three, 31%, oppose the military blockade of the Gaza Strip. These numbers still a minority in the Jewish community, but these numbers are unthinkable 10, 15, certainly 20 years ago. Absolutely unthinkable. And as, th as one who has faced those arguments there, I can tell you it wasn't pleasant, but it's getting to be a winning argument even there. But party leaders in the big media concealed this tectonic shift in general public opinion and in Jewish opinion. So now is the time to proclaim the truth across the board, we represent the new majority, and we will not be denied. The time, has come, the time has come to target Canadian corporations that profit from the misery of the Palestinian people. So here's a question for you. How's my time? Two and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Okay, good. Can any of you, and not you folks, <laughs> can any of you name any Canadian companies that operate in occupied Palestine? Let me give you a list. Actuonics Motion de Devices, based in Canada, provides micro motion solutions for robotics, aerospace, automotive, medical, and radio control industries. Actuonics. Bombardier, the Canadian multinational aerospace and transportation company. It says it's no longer involved in Jerusalem light rail, but a senior manager of Bombardier has gone over to WSP. What's WSP? I get this from Karen. WSP, Parsons Brinkerhoff, provides technical expertise and strategic advice in property and buildings, transportation and infrastructure sectors. FE Solar. FE Solar Enterprises Incorporated is a renewable power developer with projects in Ontario, New Jersey, Saipan, and Israel. The Metro Ontario Group is a private Canadian corporation with investments in real estate, environmental development, nuclear medicine, marine agriculture, and tourism. That's a good list to start. Have you heard the news, though? Have you heard the news? South Africa has broken diplomatic relations with Israel. One minute, Barry. But Trudeau and Freeland, following in the footsteps of Stephen Harper, continue a free trade and military security alliance with the Zionist state. 
and NDP MP Randall Garrison was recently reappointed vice chair of the Canada-Israel Interparliamentary Group, which promotes solidarity with a government that says Israel is a national homeland for the Jews and not a state for all of its residents. Randall Garrison is retiring, and now his policy should be retired, and Jagmeet Singh ought to learn the lesson of Paul Manley, or Jagmeet Singh must go too. Around the world today, there are many states guilty of atrocious conditions. The importance of Israel is that it is a linchpin of global imperialist rule. Richard Nixon, a strident anti-Semite, put it best when he called Israel, and I quote, America's biggest aircraft carrier in the Mediterranean. Freedom for Palestine means freedom for humanity, and for that reason, we will not stop demanding end the occupation, down with the Zionist apartheid state, for the right of all refugees to return to their homes, lift the siege of Gaza for a democratic and secular Palestine for all its residents, Muslims, Jews, Christians, atheists, and agnostics, disarm the nuclear power starting with the USA and its Israeli client state from the river to the sea. Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Karen. Yeah, it seems like just not so long ago I was here speaking to uh, this group or a group very similar uh, through Socialist Action at one of your conferences. At that time, I um, I gave you a couple of quotes from Hansard and asked you who you had thought um, had said those when they were from. And people made comments thinking that maybe they were from the Wynn government or from um, or from the current Trudeau government. But um, as we unpacked them, we found out that they were actually from Premier Bill Davis and the previous minister, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau. So I just start by saying that even as the call of the BDS National Committee, or the BNC, was made back in 2005, the work, of course, of BDS work did begin back in 1948. Um, through the Arab League and with the work of the First Intifada uh, in Palestine itself as well. And the work was well underway here in Canada in terms of Israeli goods and, um, and um, especially as we went into developing the uh, post-OPEC uh, times with the Arab states and the relationships in terms of, uh, of BDS. So it was really interesting to see that back in the 1970s, the words that were being spoken in our federal and provincial legislatures aren't all that much different than they, they are today. And perhaps this is not so surprising as the United Nations General Assembly passed Resolution 3379 back in 1975 that had a very clear message, and that is that Zionism is racism. And, um, of course, that message was revoked in uh, 1991 by the United Nations, but um, really that is, is the message. So in considering today's... Uh, uh, topic before us and in considering Zionism, I want to do something similar and read a, a quote again, this time more around Zionism. And I know that uh, some of us have been around this uh, work for a long time, a lot longer than I have, so some of you may uh, recognize this quote. So just listen um, and see if you can tell me who, where, when. There is usually a way in which controversy can be carried out with decency, the quote begins. However, I have found no way to criticize the policies of the state of Israel or question the philosophy of political Zionism or tell my readers what the facts of the Middle East are and escape slander and liable from the Zionist Israeli community. In Israel, it is different. Any ideas yet? The person goes on to say, I thought you were going to say Dimitri maybe, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, the person goes on to say, for expressing my opinions and publishing my conclusions, I have been called an anti-Semite and other things. This used to hurt very much until I learned what distinguished company I was in. When critics of the Israeli policy or Zionist philosophy, and in some instances even those who without attaching blame told the story of the Palestinian refugees, they were called anti-Semitic. They were discredited, in some cases, professionally destroyed. 
This is too bad, for anti-Semitism is a nasty thing, and the sting should not be taken from it. It is demeaning to treat any person as something lesser or inferior because of his race, religion, or name. It demeans the object and the subject. However, the label has been pinned on so many so often by such fanatical and foolish, and I'm going to say the word men, because that will give you a hint of when it maybe was written, um, is pinned um, on so many and so often by fanatical and foolish men that it isn't taken seriously anymore. Any ideas? Albert Einstein. Could have been, but it wasn't. It was within actually a Canadian context. Okay, I'm going to read just one more short quote, and I think some of you will get it. Nobody yet? Okay. No? No, no, probably, no, I don't think so. Other ideas? Okay, in 30 years or more or less of public church life, 15 of them editing the largest, and I like to think, this is the person saying this, I'd like to think in some ways one of the most respected church papers in the British Commonwealth, I have never known anything like it. One cannot take a place as a responsible editor of a free church press without angering some people, but with Israel it is different. Could have been, but a few decades before that. It was 1970, and it was Reverend Dr. A.C. Forrest, um, who was the editor of the then United Church Observer, and it was in his first edition of The, Un the Unholy Land, and by that point, um, Forrest had dared to share his investigative reporting from on the ground in the now-occupied Palestine, because it was right after 1967, so the, uh, um, the, as we know, West Bank and East Jerusalem today, um, and elsewhere in the Middle East. He traveled through Jordan and Syria and Lebanon and into, uh, into 48, or the state known as Israel. <laughs> And he shared that in The Observer and um, also in his book, The Unholy Land. And he shared news, news that other people weren't sharing even then. And in those days, you know, if you look at the Toronto Star or um, the other papers, other national papers at the time, you'll find news that's much more balanced than you would today, balanced, quote unquote, right? But you would find um, letters to the editors that were actually published back and forth, very different. But he shared the news of the, na the napalm attacks on the refugees that were fleeing towards Jericho in 1967, making their way to Jordan over the bridge. Did you know that napalm was used in 1967? I didn't actually know that. And in fact, the observer didn't even themselves print some of the pictures. But of course, we remember the Vietnam, very iconic pictures, right? No, no. anyway. He also shared the military occupation that had occurred for two decades in the state of Israel from 1948 to 1966. How many of you know that uh, basically the same thing's happening in occupied uh, West Bank uh, and East Jerusalem, and uh, well, as is a little different story, but in the occupied West Bank and East Jerusalem were essentially the same things that happened for 20 years, fairly unspoken of in the state of Israel. He also shared and spoke of FATA and the PLO and the Popular Front, providing details, talking about people, making it normal, bringing a human face to the resistance with facts, not just from uh, occupied Palestine, but from the other countries in the Middle East, including the refugee camps, probably Delia, your family in a refugee camp. My father and mother. Yeah. For a very short time. Short time, yeah. Um, and so rather than the rhetoric of terrorism, so let's think today about the elected, democratically elected parties, Hamas, Hezbollah, uh, think about the Popular Front and the Democratic Front and how we stay away from that, but uh, Dr. Robert Forrest went into those. And he spoke very specifically of 1948, but he stopped short of using the word NAPCA, meaning catastrophe, the NAPCA, or genocide. And still today, the United Church will not allow those words or the word apartheid to be used. I know that from being an ecumenical accompanier in Palestine in 2014, that I was not allowed to use the three words. And that's one of the reasons that the United uh, Network for Just Peace in Israel-Palestine, which is a group of United Church folks, are not a member of the Canadian BDS coalition, but a friend, because they don't agree with our words, right? Um, and he spoke clearly, Dr. Forrest spoke clearly, about the right of return that had been denied at that time for 20 years. At that time, a Canadian icon, Pierre Burton, who remembers Pierre Burton here? Yeah, most of you, right? He came to Forrest's defense when Forrest was called anti-Semite, 
and said the real issue that was causing the Zionist attack wasn't, was amongst all these things he had said, was about the right of return. Um, so um, Forrest goes on in his book and talks about the allegations and the falsehoods that he was accused of. He talks about uh, things that were not factual, um, that were said about him. And you know what? They sound pretty much what we read in today's Facebook posts and tweets. Um, not much different, really, when you read them. And in fact, the allegations of lawsuits following did follow, with Forrest suing Brene Brith, and Brene Brith uh, counter suing back Forrest, the United Church of Canada, and the Observer. It took um, a little bit of work in late 1972 and through into 1973 with some issues management and change of leadership, a new general secretary, which is the top position of uh, the United Church, to be somebody who was not pro-Palestinian, and the election of um, someone who I really quite respect, but he's very much a progressive except Palestine, uh, the Reverend Dr. Bruce McLeod as the elected uh, new moderator. And with all of that, everybody went into the back room with Brene Brith and the, the Canadian Jewish Congress in the United Church, uh, but they didn't take Dr. Forrest into the uh, room with them. And for six uh, months, they had meetings. And uh, in May of 1973, an agreement with Brene Breath and the United Church of Canada that's still in place was put in place, and a subsequent agreement that we've not been able to get a hold of uh, with the Canadian Jewish Congress after that. I only share this to remind you that the tactics. Um, are pretty similar to what you in this room have seen in the work that Barry, I think, just referred to around the NDP. And I look at my good friend uh, Dimitri and watch the uh, the the struggle, the the work to get the uh, incredible policy in place for the Green Party uh, two years ago, um, and how Elizabeth May distances herself from that. And so the folks in this room well know how labor over the years. Um, and um, and uh, and the NDP themselves have also distanced themselves from from this, and so um, I just I bring that to say that you know the threat in many ways is not just the threat of the Zionists, but it's the threat of our own left-leaning, very neoliberal, if the truth be known, organizations. I was introduced as a United Church minister. That's correct. Uh, I uh, was ordained in June of 2015. I did not really uh, serve for a church for very long, about 10 months, and just for the, just for the record, just for transparency, um, I'd already been called a terrorist uh, while I had been in Palestine before I got back, because I'd been in the West Bank, at least allegedly I had been, and um, when I refused to be supervised by a minister who is Zionist and takes tours to, uh, to Israel with a uh, career military uh, second career tour guide who lives in the illegal settlement of Ariel, um, I was put under investigation even though I was no longer in that congregation and even though the church polity didn't really require for that. I am still ordained simply because there is a case before the Human Rights Tribunal of Ontario on the worldview that I, worldview is a, uh, an anti-Zionist. So I don't plan, I didn't plan maybe to go there, but just for transparency, it shows you that is at work right right now. And um, yeah, so I'd like to sort of just in my last few minutes, if I can, uh, turn and uh, talk about two things. One is the Canadian BDS Coalition. Um, I don't think I'm really the national coordinator, but I am certainly one of the people who have worked the last three years to get uh, that organization together, and I might be perceived as that because I'm the one that tends to call the meetings and uh, do different things to get three things minutes. happening. Um, so the BDS Coalition, just to let you know, is 30 groups from across the country. We came together three years ago, um, local groups and national groups, including Socialist Action and the Canadian Federation of Students and other groups, I heard you. And um, you can check out our campaign at uh, www.bdscoalition.ca. Um, probably um, a number of wins that we've had, including uh, Bombardier at least appearing to pull out of the Jerusalem light rail, um, although I don't think they cancelled their $168 million contract they signed last year, at least they haven't verified that. But um, the, the most amazing was that Air Canada actually pulled out two years into a five-year contract with Israeli aerospace industries to um, 
to service our commercial jets. So um, I just raise that, say take a look. Um, we're involved in lots of different international campaigns and linking with uh, international campaigns. You know, when Brian Adams was uh, playing in Israel, we were able to get some of our uh, comrades across uh, Europe, including Austria and Germany and other places, to have actions to welcome him. Uh, uh, not so much to say uh, we don't support him, those kinds of things. Um, in regard to Just Peace Advocates, this is a group that we have put together to fill a gap based on discussions uh, within the broader Palestinian solidarity community to uh, say that we really do uh, we do need to have that human rights focus and to um, to be able to uh, ideally have something like a Palestine legal. We're a long way from that here in Canada at this point, although people are doing some amazing work, including uh, our friend Dimitri. And one of the campaigns with um, with Just Peace Advocates uh, that I ask you to search out is Gaza 2020. It's been put together um, with Al Haq, which is the uh, premier um, human rights international law group in uh, Palestine. Uh, founded by my good friend, our good friend Jonathan Katab, uh, back in 1979. It's the organization that takes uh, cases to the International Criminal Court. And really what we're doing with that campaign is trying to hold uh, all countries internationally accountable because sanctions are what's needed. That's what the Palestinians told us three years ago when they came to, um, to Canada for this World Social Forum, and we know that's what it really takes to make that change from... South Africa and other experiences. So in this case, Gaza 2020 is a call not just to respect international law, which under Article 1 of the Fourth Geneva Convention needs to be respected, but also to support and to respect our own uh, our own uh, legislation for special economic measures under that particular act. And um, yeah, 100 organizations, including some pretty mainline ones, signed on to that. We've managed to take that to Freeland and Trudeau, well, especially to Freeland, a few times, including <coughs> personally into our office the other day, again, for Napka Day. We have not got any response since November from her, but nor have we from any of the other political parties, nor even uh, even our uh, diplomat in, uh, in Ramallah either. So um, I just, I raise that and say, take a look at uh, www.justpeaceadvocates.ca for a bit more information. and. Um, I expect our best chance um, is to continue with our own steadfastness, but remember probably our own biggest challenge is often our own left-leaning or left-leaning organizations that attempt to mitigate and distance themselves from our work. Thank you. Thank you, Dimitri. Thank you having me tonight. It's always a pleasure to join my comrades uh, in the show socialist movement. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, the title of our uh, panel this evening was, uh, I'm told, why is, why, is, why are Zionists in such a panic? I think uh, the starting point for understanding why there's such in such a panic is this simple principle that impunity makes people stupid. And what do I, what do I mean by that? I mean that for so long, the Zionist entity has gotten away quite literally with murder, that all the pretense of it being a, a multifaceted democracy, a beacon of enlightenment and human rights in a sea of tyranny in the Middle East, it has been dropped. And even to the point now where Netanyahu openly rejects any notion of a two-state solution. It has absolutely no interest, he's not even pretending. And for the longest time, because of the leaders, the leaders of the Zionist entity felt that their project was uncertain, that its fate was uncertain, that they needed to be mindful of international public opinion, they maintained certain pretenses, one of which was that they were genuinely interested in allowing the Palestinian people in their own homeland to have a viable state. That's now gone. Why? Because impunity makes people stupid. And this has resulted, as Barry explained in some detail, uh, in a massive shift in public opinion in the West. And as uh, my other speakers have uh, pointed out, it's also resulted in major victories uh, from the perspective of the boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. But there's a third prong to this, and this is what I want to talk about tonight, and that is that the Palestinian solidarity movement has begun to fight back in the courts, and they're winning. 
and this is a this is a major, I think, trauma for uh, the uh, the Zionist lobby and for the Zionist state. They have, they're not accustomed to seeing Palestinian solidarity activists take the offensive in the courtroom. One example, uh, a, a victory that was uh, earned this year, was in the state of Texas, where a federal judge issued an injunction against a state law which required public employees and companies that contract with the state of Texas to certify that they will not participate in the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement. Mm -hmm. And the judge said that that's a violation of the First Amendment right to free speech. There was a similar victory against a similar law in the state of Kansas, and I believe there might have been a third one. Uh, so within the United States, which has typically been the Western state that has been most uh, fanatical in its support for the state of Israel, we are seeing judges uh, invoking First Amendment rights to protect the, uh, the Palestinian solidarity activism of American citizens. Here in this country, we are seeing similar developments. Whether these will ultimately re result in, uh, in the kinds of victories we see in the United States remains to be seen. One such uh, development uh, involved uh, me. Uh, 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 don't be shy. <laughs> uh, and it's a, it, this is a work in progress. It's not. Uh, it's it, it's not a resol it's not a litigation that's been resolved by any means. But in 2016, B'nai B'rith Canada, uh, on the eve of the Green Party's uh, biennial convention, at which I was arguing for the adoption of a policy expressing support for boycott, divestment, and sanctions, on the eve of that convention, they issued a report. Uh, claiming me to be a supporter of terrorists. The basis of the allegation was that uh, several months earlier I had gone to Palestine and at the uh, suggestion of a friend of mine, Rehab Nazal, I met a Palestinian lawyer in East Jerusalem by the name of... Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. And um, his son, I, didn't, I, I had never met him before, I didn't know who he was, but Rehab uh, assured me that it would be worthwhile to sit down and talk to him. And I spent two hours with him in the lobby of my hotel in East Jerusalem, and he explained to me that several months earlier his son had been killed by uh, Israeli forces in an alleged uh, terror attack in a settlement in East Jerusalem, in which several settlers had been killed. And he told me that, uh, first of all, he didn't believe the allegation against his son. He said that he demanded proof that he, in fact, had participated in this attack. He didn't believe he was capable of doing such a thing. He was a well-respected, peace-loving activist but they refused to give him evidence. They said, secondly, he demanded the body of his son back because he wanted it, first of all, to be buried properly, but he also uh, wanted his, his son's body to be examined forensically to try to ascertain how he had died. And the Israeli authorities refused to produce his son's body to him. And he told me he had learned that it was lying on a piece of, and he put it to me in this way, his son's body was lying on a piece of ice like a slab of meat. And they simply refused to allow him to have it back. And then finally, um, he told me that he was enlisted by other families who were unable to obtain uh, the bodies of their slain children from Israeli authorities to speak on their behalf and try to negotiate a resolution. And when the Israeli authorities made a final offer, which was completely unacceptable, uh, the, their, their children had to be buried within five minutes and only 10 people could be present and it had to be done at night. Uh, within 24 hours of his communicating on behalf of these families, a rejection of that offer, Israeli authorities demolished his home, rendering his entire family homeless. On that basis, I spoke out in his defense, not to defend anything that his son did, but to defend the principle, the prohibition against collective punishment, because he himself and his children, his surviving children, and his spouse and his parents, who all lived in that house, had not been accused of any wrongdoing, let alone proven to have committed any wrongdoing. This was a clear violation of international law. I spoke out against it, and for that I was called a supporter of terrorists. So I sued B'nai B'rith for defamation. B'nai B'rith then uh, invoked a newly adopted anti-slap law in Ontario. This is this legislation which des is designed to defeat litigation, which uh, the ultimate aim of which is to silence people. So I was being accused by B'nai B'rith in this motion under the anti-slap legislation of trying to silence B'nai B'rith. Uh, to my great chagrin, uh, the motions judge, a single judge of the Superior Court of Justice, uh, agreed with B'nai B'rith, saying that there was, uh, you know, it was possible that B'nai B'rith would succeed ultimately on the fair comment defense because one could believe that a person who speaks out in defense of this family is a supporter of terrorists. 
Uh, I was uh, quite, uh, as you can imagine, uh, disturbed by the decision. Uh, I retained uh, Marie Hena uh, to be uh, my counsel at the Court of Appeal. And uh, after she, uh, she defended my position, I think, as well as any counsel could possibly have defended one's position, uh, a three-judge panel ruled unanimously in my favor and restored my defamation action. So this is, this is ongoing. The Neighbor of Canada has, by the way, sought leave to appeal the Court of Appeals decision to the Supreme Court of Canada, and there's actually a good chance uh, that, that it will be granted because the Court of Appeal has already granted leave to hear two other appeals under the anti-slap legislation. So there's some chance that I'm going to have to go all the way to the Supreme Court of Canada just to be able to have the opportunity to have a trial in my case. Uh, in addition to my having sued B'nai B'rith for defamation, so too has the Canadian Union of Postal Workers, which was accused by B'nai B'rith falsely, of course, of having supported the pro-Palestinian Postal Workers Union or pro-terrorist pro Palestinian Postal Workers Union. Of course, it's not pro-terrorist whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so too has uh, Canadian Friends of Seville. Uh, they brought Reverend Naim Atik, a leading proponent of Palestinian liberation theology, to Canada. He did a book tour, and B'nai B'rith accused uh, both Reverend Atik and Canadian Friends of Seville of having, uh, having engaged in a, an anti-Semitic book tour. And I'm acting as uh, the counsel for uh, Canadian Friends of Appeal in that case. And that case is far from being concluded. So there's three uh, pieces of defamation litigation going on against B'nai B'rith Canada, probably the most outspoken, certainly within the lobby community, the most outspoken defender of Israel. And they responded to this by going to their supporters, and they said, uh, you know, we are being attacked uh, in a strategy of lawfare. We need your help. Uh, please give us more money. <laughs> so, quite apart from the use of defamation laws, uh, there's a very interesting piece of litigation that has been brought forward by a member of the Jewish community in Winnipeg, a friend of mine and my client, David Kattenberg, uh, who has initiated, on his own initiative, at a time when no one was representing him, in January of 2017, he went to the Liquor Control Board of Ontario and complained about wines, two wines being produced in Israel's illegal settlements in the West Bank, but which are labeled as product of Israel. And after six months of meticulous uh, consideration of his complaint, involving specialists from the Canadian Food Inspection Agency from around the country, from the East Coast to the West Coast, and a lot of tortuous internal deliberations, because I think they appreciated that this was a politically explosive issue, they agreed with David. And in July of 2017, they ordered the LCBO to remove these bottles from the shelves of liquor, of, of, of liquor outlets in Ontario so that they could be properly labeled. Within 24 hours, and, and, and by the way, this decision was not communicated to David. Uh, he found out about the decision because Bene Brith found out about it and put a post on its website on July 11, 2017, screaming bloody murder. And within seven hours, within seven hours, uh, Politicians within the Liberal government forced the Canadian Food Inspection Agency to reverse the decision of the staff, which had taken six months to be rendered. At that point, David retained me, and we brought a judicial review application in the Federal Court of Canada, and we argued it uh, last week in two days here in Toronto. And I think that what happened in the courtroom was, was extremely telling. It was for me... You know, I have already, uh, for those of you who know my public commentary about the Trudeau government, you know that I have you know, a rather cynical view of the Liberals and the Trudeau government. Uh, <laughs> so we all do, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, even, even I was surprised by the level of cynicism in, in, in the government's position in this case. So David's case is fundamentally based on two federal statutes the Fruit and Drugs Act, and the Consumer Packaging and Lab Labeling Act. And both of these statutes have a prohibition against misleading advertising on consumer products. Mm -hmm. And this prohibition is very broadly worded. So the government went into court, and they, 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 are, they put forward an argument which you would normally hear from a corporation that is being regulated and that wants to free itself of the burdens of regulation. You would not normally hear this coming from the government which is supposed to be protecting consumers. Their argument was 
that those prohibitions against misleading advertising only have to do with representations that concern health and safety. Okay. They don't have to do with anything else. So, for example, if you buy a food product and you're somebody who's deeply concerned about animal rights, and the maker of the product represents to you that the animals were raised in a humane manner, but it's a bald-faced lie, according to the government, you have no remedy under the federal statutes. Because it doesn't concern your health and safety. It concerns the health and safety of the I'll animal, perhaps, but not your health and safety. <laughs> Let's suppose you're concerned about uh, buying locally because you want to support Canadian industry, Canadian employees. And somebody falsely represents that the product is made locally when in fact it's made to some distant country and transported long distances and does, is of no benefit to Canadian labor. According to the government, you're out of luck. You've been lied to. It's not a domestically produced product. It's produced in a foreign country. You care deeply about it being locally produced, but you've got no remedy. Let's suppose you care about the environment and you want to buy locally because you don't want products to be transported long distances and generate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and somebody lies to you that the product is made locally, you have no remedy. The government was willing to throw Canadian consumers under the bus in order to defend its indefensible decision. And the government said something else that was quite remarkable. It said the reason why we ultimately made our, the decision that the product of Israel was okay is because Palestine is not a country and the law requires you to identify a country. So the closest is? So the closest was Israel. And so therefore, you know, this was fine. This was a reasonable decision. Well, there's one little problem with this, and that is that there's a regulation uh, that the Canadian food, a guidance that the Canadian Food Inspection Agency has issued, which allows producers of wines in the United States to disclose only the state in which the product is made. So if you're a producer of wine in California, you don't have to say product of the United States. You can say product of California. And the CFIA says that's not misleading because everybody knows where California is. Well, if you apply that logic to our situation, product of Israel is obviously misleading because everybody in the courtroom agreed that the West Bank is not part of Israel. The government agreed in the courtroom the West Bank is not part of Israel. We took that position. Independent Jewish Voices, which intervened, took that position. And even B'nai B'rith Canada, which was also allowed to intervene, acknowledged that the West Bank is not part of Israel, they claimed it was disputed territory. And there was a point in the hearing where the judge looked at the B'nai B'rith lawyer, David Matus, and said to him, so everybody else here has admitted, Mr. Matus, that the West Bank is not part of Israel. What do you have to say? And he just reluctantly agreed, well, yes. Even under Israeli law, it's not, at this point in time, considered part of Israel. And so, at not yet. Uh, and it'll be interesting to see what would happen in the courtroom if that were the case, but it, this is the current re reality with which we're dealing. And uh, my sense of the judge's <coughs> reaction to the arguments that she was hearing, uh, you know, is, was that she was profoundly skeptical. One minute. Uh, you know, ultimately we don't know what, how she's going to rule. Uh, we may have a decision within the next several weeks, possibly months, but uh, I certainly feel after having sat in the courtroom for two days, and just based on the law and the evidence that was before the court, that we have a very good shot. And I think that if David Kattenberg succeeds in this endeavor, uh, that will be an earthquake yeah. in Canada. And I hope so. And internationally. And I very much hope it is. Thank you very much. Okay, folks, we're going to open up the floor now for uh, questions or interventions, and each of you that want to speak will get up to three minutes. We will, people got paper there, I hope, or remember the questions, because our format is that we take about three questions, so more people can speak, and then come back to the panel, and they will have uh, three minutes each if they wish to speak on that particular question. Okay, so we're going to open up the floor. Uh, Peter, uh, Comrade Peter DeGamma has got the uh, roving mic, as we call it, so he will come to you <clears throat> once I take the speaker's list. Okay, so the list is now open. Okay, okay. Chris. <coughs> Down here, sorry, Peter. Chris, Chris one. Chris. Here. No, Chris Abbas. Oh, Chris W. Yeah. Uh, a question for Barry and for anybody else on the panel. 
Uh, some people say that uh, to be anti-Zion or anti-Zionist is uh, anti-Semitic, and uh, that theme was touched on briefly, but I'm just wondering what you would have to say to that. Okay, Christian, right behind Chris. Oh boy, I can hear my voice, this is awkward. Um, so, something I, I've just taken notes throughout this, and something I sort of thought of when this was all going on is when we talk, I think a lot of people compare the situation in Palestine to South Africa. And, you know, we look at that both in terms of how they are similar historically, and we sort of look to that as an example of how we can, you know, liberate Palestine and free the people there. But I guess the third part of that story also is that in South Africa, as much has been achieved, there's still a lot of these sort of material and structural problems uh, that exist from that apartheid. And I'm sort of wondering what we're thinking of going forward, how we can avoid creating the same situation when we free Palestine. Okay. Uh, yes. Maria, from France, go ahead. Cameron. Um, it's not a, a question, but a, it's a remark about the situation in France. Um, because uh, in France, we, we know a criminaliz uh, criminalization of the uh, movement for the support of the uh, Palestinian cause. Um, as you know, in uh, France, uh, since uh, 2016, uh, we know a big uh, repression against the social movement. And this is interesting because the first demonstration um, that the, the government has forbidden is a demonstration for the support of the Palestinian movement in 2014. And uh, with the new anti-capitalist party in 2014, we decided to um, to uh, organize the demonstration, even if the government uh, uh, forbids uh, the demonstration. Uh, so, uh, and uh, recently, uh, the government used um, anti-Semitic aggression, uh, especially. Um, um, an aggression against a racist uh, intellectual and African quote. It's a true intellectual, but he he's very um, Zionist and he's a racist. He's a Islamophobe, and um, um, some people um, uh, they they attack him and uh, they uh, they um, they say. Uh, uh, anti-Semitic, uh, uh, anti-Semitic uh, um, uh, sentences. Uh, so, and uh, the Macron's government uh, used this uh, this uh, this assault uh, to um, to explain that uh, anti uh, anti-Zionism is uh, anti-Semitic. And uh, so, it's uh, and um, f as a larger scale. I think that in France we have a problem because uh, since 2014 we, we didn't organize any demonstration for the support of the Palestinian movement. And, and I think it's a, it's a big problem because in France the support for the Palestinian movement is very big. But uh, the, 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 the workers' movement uh, leadership is very... Um, uh, it's a very current about uh, this question. Okay, we have s still two names, but I'm going to, uh, because there was two questions and an intervention, I'll take two more, and then I'll come back to the list. Go ahead. Recently, uh, Trudeau, who got to be prime minister by default, time and time again in town hall meetings and other places, he kept on uh, emphasizing that why he's against BDS and so on, that it's anti-Semitic and all the crap that he says, that also Canada has the same values as Israel. 
Well, I was totally disturbed because if that's true, like uh, Palestinians in Israel itself who are so-called Israeli citizens have no right whatsoever, or the refugees that come from Africa there are banned by law from getting any medical help, or the Palestinians at home demolished in West Bank and Gaza the way it is, uh, you know, all of this. If Canada has the same values, I think tomorrow morning I'm getting a ticket to get out of Canada. <laughs> so maybe you can verify if that's really true, like Canada has the same values as Israel. Okay, one more speaker, YC. I su support my previous co uh, comrade's uh, remark because uh, it segues into my question, which is we do have a very important uh, federal election coming up. Uh, so my question to all of you panelists is, uh, if you had a face-to-face -face conversation with um, the Honorable uh, Christia Freeland, what would you ask her? What would you say? How would you, um, uh, what sort of a framing of a question would you pose to her in order to um, uh, speak the truth. Okay, we get, uh, we're going to come back to the panel and I'll come to John and Gary on, on the next list and Robbie's speakers that I already have. Okay, so we're going to go back. You each have three minutes, uh, comrades. I know it's not much time, but see what you can do. Uh, and we're going to start with Dimitri, then Karen, then Barry, and then Dalia. Dimitri? I've, I've actually given a good deal of thought to your question, although I don't expect I'll ever have the chance to ask this question to Christina Freeling face to face, and that is, uh, you know, her government uh, has very, uh, 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 very aggressively pursued a sanctions regime against uh, the Russian Federation. And in fact, uh, if I recall correctly, when they were in opposition, the Trudeau liberals were criticizing the Harper government for not having been hard enough on Russia. And the principal justification for sanction in Russia is that Russia has purportedly illegally annexed Crimea, even though there was a referendum in Crimea in which over 90% of the people who voted, and the vast majority of people did vote, uh, voted for union with the Russian Federation. So the, the argument is, this was an illegal annexation of Crimea, and we are therefore going to sanction you, Russia. Well, the policy of the Canadian government, and anybody can see this on the Global Affairs website, is entirely in accordance with international law and the international consensus that Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem is a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. The Canadian government itself says this, and yet they won't even talk about sanctioning Israel in the Trudeau government, let alone imposing sanctions on Israel. So I would love to ask her to explain okay. that contradiction. Uh, and I suspect that uh, she would have no answer, because there is none. <laughs> So that's mine. Okay. Karen? Um, maybe I'll start by picking up on the question about what when Palestine is free. And yeah, that is um, something I think it's really worth uh, thinking and wondering about because certainly the neoliberalism that you're seeing within Palestine, and I had the uh, privilege of being in Palestine about five months in 2018 through two uh, times that I was there is um, is really, you know, the revolution needs to be fought at many levels. Of first, the occupation needs to end, uh, apartheid needs to end, right of return is essential, but uh, the revolution is by no means uh, ended. And even from 2014, when I had been in Palestine previous until last year, the, the role of neoliberalism, the impact of 70 years of colonization, uh, including uh, uh, a number of Palestinian, a large number of young Palestinians uh, in uh, 1948 joining the Israeli military. All of those same things that we know from being a colonized state here uh, in Canada in terms of our, our own uh, our own role as a colonizer. Um, in terms of the values and Jake's question, um, yeah, so I mean it is uh, very much, uh, we're, it's a colonial settler uh, framework and so maybe there isn't as much uh, difference as we think and also uh, Canada and uh, and most of the uh, 
most of the quote-unquote Western world was settled under Christ Christendom, which really is the uh, the combination of the Christian state, uh, you know, just as the Jewish state uh, replaced that, just as Christendom was sort of coming to the end at the end of the Second World War, all those uh, cracks that took about 500 years from the Reformation to, uh, to break open uh, was replaced with a new form of uh, religious uh, state that seems to go beyond, uh, well beyond the, uh, the borders of Israel and, and impact on the country. Trees. Um, yeah, so with uh, Christia Freeland, I like uh, Dimitri's question and certainly the focus on sanctions. 30 um, seconds. Um, may, there's many letters that we've written to Christia, and I don't expect we will uh, hear from them. I certainly know uh, and have sat through her speaking uh, to Zionist uh, groups here in uh, Toronto with Urban Kotler and uh, Carolyn Bennett and others, and I expect we'd know her answer if we could get to see her, but the one that I would take. Uh, to, to her would be around no way to treat a child and the defense for children uh, international Palestine and how can uh, it be okay to uh, to torture a, a child. Um, she has responded in letters, that's the only letter in fact that she's responded to that I'm aware of uh, uh, during her time in office and it was a pretty uh, disgusting uh, answer so I think we try to hold her accountable because even some hardcore Zionists find it hard to uh, say it's okay to torture a child. Uh, um, um, and Palestine is the only country that does that uh, system. Israel is the only country that does that systemically uh, to to children. Okay, Barry. Thanks very much. Well, the the argument that um, anti-Zionism is equivalent to anti-Semitism is one of the great uh, lies being perpetrated uh, on a, on a global scale. But it uh, it has less and less. Um, um, acceptance uh, in, in political discourse. Uh, first of all, in terms of untangling this, I suggest that people uh, view a video. It, uh, it's, a, it's a presentation by Noam Chomsky on why anti-Zionism is not anti-Semitism. It's a YouTube video that was made in 2015 by Richard Ruiz, and it's been seen by at least 16,000 people, at least according to the recent tally. Uh, he quotes extensively Abba Iban, who was the um, Israeli uh, representative to the UN in the, in the 60s, who says that uh, we have to convince people that critics of Israel are anti-Semitic. Anti and for those who, like Chomsky, are critics of Israel uh, and who are Jews, uh, at least in origin, uh, well, they, they, they are self-hating. Uh, Jews and they need to be psychoanalyzed and, uh, and intervened <laughs> by medical authorities. Uh, but the going to the root of it, it, you need to understand what Zionism is. Uh, it's not a religious movement. Zionism is a political ideology that supports the creation of an exclusivist colonial settler state in Palestine in which only Jews can be first-class citizens. So what is anti-Zionism? Anti-Zionism rejects that ideology. It rejects it as racist, as chauvinist, and it criticizes the policies, practices, and foundations of the, Jew of the, of the Zionist state of Israel. Now, many Jews and non-Jews take an anti-Zionist position. Zionism falsely claims that the state of Israel represents the interests of all Jews, which on the face of it is impossible. Uh, Jews are not a nation, but a religion-linked uh, ethnicity. Jews belong to different classes, to different nations, and therefore do not have a common economic or any other interest that sets them apart from the rest of humanity. It is racist to suggest the opposite. But Zionism is not the first racist ideology that seeks to advance a political project of dispossession and colonialism. Anti-Semitism is Jew hatred. Anti-Zionism is not about religion or about Jews in part or in whole. It is opposition to a racist political ideology, whereas Zionism promotes racism. Anti-Zionists are in the forefront of campaigns against racism of all kinds. Judaism is in conflict with Zionism, say the ultra-Orthodox rabbis who demonstrated with us on May the 18th. Now there are many books that you can read on this subject, including The Jewish Question by Avram Leon. The Non-Jewish Jew by Isaac Deutscher, and that book is on the table there, and Judy will be happy to sell it to you. Uh, Zionism, The False Messiah by Nathan Weinstock, and Israel, A Colonial Settler State by Maxine Rodenson. 
In addition, I think many of you know that Karl Marx, Leon Trotsky, August Babel, and Ernest Mandel wrote much about the origins of anti-Semitism and how to fight it, and to fight it via socialist internationalism, not by descending into the cesspool of Jewish or any nationalism. Time? Yes. Okay, I'll come back later and try to answer the other questions. Okay, gentlemen. So asking uh, Christy Friedland, I don't think it would make a difference, honestly, because I think she is very pro-Zionist. But the thing that I would ask her to justify is that if they believe that before 1948 there was nothing called Palestine, then how would she justify the export of the Palestinian orange during the 1930s to Canada? I would ask her to go, she would have to go back and justify that because it, the labels clearly say it from the state of Palestine to Canada. So how would she justify that? How did they receive something from a country that doesn't exist? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yes, I'll put your name now. We're coming back to the floor. We have quite a few names, so um, Suzanne. Thank you very much uh, for these wonderful speeches, uh, full of education and uh, inspiration. Uh, I, I'd like to talk about, um, you know, we're all friends in this room. And we all have an understanding, basic understanding, about socialism and about Zionism and about Israel, blah, blah. Okay. The point that I want to make is this. It was said that we are gaining strength with the BDS movement. And it gives us a lot of heart that we fought so hard for so many years and now it's beginning that people are beginning to understand BDS and coming to that understanding. But we have, I think, an obligation. When we talk to the public the public does not have the same understanding as we have. They don't understand Zionism. They think all Jews are Zionists. They all think that Zionism has the same meaning. We need to understand that. But the word that I want to emphasize is Israel. When we refer to Israel, we should take the opportunity of educating the public and say Israeli apartheid because we want to be more specific. What do we mean by Israel? When they talk about Canada, you know, we can say colonial Canada, we can say racist Canada, whatever. But when we talk to Israel, we're trying to educate the public. I say, let's talk about the government of Israel who is responsible for the murders and everything that's going on to, uh, against the Palestinians. And let's talk about Israeli apartheid, down with Israeli apartheid not down with Israel, down with Israel apartheid. Thank you. Thank you. John? John? Oh, I'm waiting for the mic. Okay, sorry. Uh, I'm afraid you're going to have to get a ticket and leave because the uh, countries are the same, colonial settler states. And 19th century and 18th century Canada the treatment of its indigenous peoples is essentially the same as the 20th century obliteration of the Palestinians. So that's why we get along so well. We are the same, so nice to know you. Um, I, I lived through the uh, transition uh, of the uh, anti-apartheid movement from fringe to popular to successful. And what I noted uh, in retrospect is the role of the media and the popular culture 
in uh, aligning with the, the, the popular movements. And I think that, uh, I haven't analyzed it, but my guess is that it aligned well with uh, civil rights and popular uprisings in the 60s and, and 70s in, in North America. Uh, there is no such popular alignment uh, uh, today, and the, the, uh, the successful othering of the, Palesti uh, the Palestinians by the mainstream media and the, and the popular culture continues unabated. So I guess I have two practical questions on a day-to-day -day basis. When I look up BDS uh, Canada, I don't get a convenient list of these products are the ones we're focusing on. It, it doesn't seem to provide the same kind of clarity that when the 70s it says boycott South African wines or these particular products. It doesn't seem to be that kind of clarity and focus. And, and two, what are, the, uh, what are the talking points or what are the um, practical ways of, of organizing to stop the othering? Of, of the Palestinians in day-to-day -day conversations uh, that might resonate with uh, our politicians and our, and our leaders. Okay, Gary, right here, Peter. Thank you all for some excellent presentations. Um, I. Um, I think we should all acknowledge that there is a lot of anti-Semitism um, and that the core of the act of anti-Semitism, the people burning synagogues, are Trump supporters um, in the United States and right-wing supporters in other countries. Um, but we should acknowledge that it still exists and is still virulent and, uh, and uh, that sort of thing. But what we're doing has absolutely nothing to do with any of that. Now, I have a question, um, actually, for Dimitri. I work in the NDP. I'm a vice president of my riding in Vancouver Island. And um, I'm working with new um, uh, nominees for the NDP, replacing um, Murray Rankin and um, who was the guy that you just mentioned? Um, Harrison. Harrison. Yeah. Uh, who are uh, uh, Zionist supporters. Uh, trying to convince these new people, who seem much more open, to take a different attitude towards uh, the BDS movement. Um, and um, I know that you and uh, Peter Manley and others played a significant role in, uh, in the Green Party in uh, moving it towards a very good position. I mean, I don't think it endorsed the BDS movement, but it did say that the Green Party was for boycotts, for divestment, and for sanctions. Uh, uh, what is the party doing about And The other thing, as Barry said, is if uh, Jagmeet Singh can't bring himself around, then he has to go. What about in the Green Party? I mean, uh, uh, Elizabeth May uh, made some... I thought she lied about your party's position um, outright, and um, that she uh, is a Zionist. I mean, she supports Zionism. Um, so, what do you think should happen to her? What's the Green Party doing about that? Okay, we'll take one more speaker and then we'll come back to the panel. Yes, I'll put your name down. Robbie, we have a list, but I will get back to you. I don't want to take anything away from uh, Barry's rousing speech, <clears throat> and I, I do regard the cross country action as a, a very important initiative. Uh, however, I think that we should not rest on our laurels. There's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, to broaden it and make it more um, uh, diffuse across the country. There are some areas that, uh, where um, the, the, the action was, was weak um, and other areas where it was stronger. So I see it as a very good beginning, but if we're going to posit that this can become, uh, you know, a more contemporary mass action uh, movement, then we have a lot of work to do. And particularly, I think, in mobilizing uh, younger activists who are e even more on side on this issue in terms of their consciousness and their uh, understanding. <clears throat> I also want to point out that one of the missing links in this, uh, in this scenario is Quebec. And in fact, uh, 
collaboration between uh, BDS uh, and other post-Palestinian solidarity activists in Quebec and those in English Canada, there's a certain um, disjuncture which needs to be overcome. And uh, coming from Montreal, I'm acutely aware of that. There is a strong tradition of Palestinian solidarity in Quebec, pro probably stronger historically than in English Canada. And uh, I think <clears throat> um, a better understanding of the issue in the uh, broader population in Quebec. Um, but more, much more work needs to be done there as well, of course. But I think the, the issue of <clears throat> closer collaboration and coordination in our um, public activities and particularly mobilizing people in, in the streets periodically needs to be coordinated much more closely between Quebec and, uh, and uh, activists in English Canada. Okay, so we're going to come back to the panel. They have each uh, three minutes, and we're going to start with Karen, and then Dahlia, then uh, Dimitri, and Barry. Yeah, so just for uh, clarity, BDS uh, Quebec, the, uh, the BDS coalition in Quebec and Pajou are very much part of the Canadian BDS coalition. Um, certainly the campa campaigns coming out of uh, Quebec are a big part of our work, including uh, the one in regard to Quebec Hydro right now and cyberspace and uh, the Israeli military. We work really closely with Bruce Katz and Zahia al Nasseri, who is one of the founders with Just Peace Advocates with myself and Jonathan Katab. So, yeah, we're working very closely um, with uh, all together, like that's it. There are a couple of provinces where we do not have local BDS groups, so if there are people from this particular uh, a group of people who uh, can help us get a group in Prince Edward Island, that would be much appreciated. Um, we've lost some of the solidarity that we had in Halifax, so that would be appreciated. But uh, pretty much all the other provinces are covered. Um, we've got individuals in uh, New Brunswick, but not a group. So um, I would say that, yeah, Quebec, certainly they're, you know, very important. And, and the work there um, is really to uh, to be followed. And the fact there already is the Quebec uh, BDS coalition. Um, in terms of campaigns, I mean, the thing is that there just are so many campaigns. I mean, to go on to the BDS, BDSmovement.net, uh, the, um, the BNC or BDS National Committee uh, page, you'll find lots of different things and certainly many campaigns that we're working on. So to just pick uh, Jaffa oranges wouldn't quite cut it in the same way as maybe grapes did from California or other things as we're into the 21st century. Um, and the challenge is how to do that. I mean, we mentioned the win with Airbnb as an example, but the thing was that win was back... Uh, Backtrack. So you know, there's been there was a big focus for Napka Day around deactivate Airbnb, which saw twenty thousand uh, accounts uh, deactivated. As an example, not large in the scheme of the world, but certainly that's because we are working internationally. I'm on calls fairly frequently internationally on things like Airbnb, on various things related to uh, tourism more broadly, around Hewlett Packard. It'll be 15 years on July the 9th, as an example this year, 15 years since the uh, International Justice Court uh, came down with the ruling that the wall, the separation wall, the apartheid wall, um, was illegal. And um, so the focus will be back on Hewlett Packard very much for about 10 days at that time. And, uh, you know, get stickers and put those on your computer saying, my last Hewlett Packard, if you happen to own one, you know, those. Um, make sure your workplace is HP free and tell us it is so we can actually promote that, those kinds of things. Uh, June 15th is give Puma the boot um, because Puma, of course, in the soccer connection. So, I mean, if you're on social media and if you're within our own echo chamber, you're probably seeing those and hearing about those. Some of them, of course, are specific to uh, our own Canadian campaigns as well. We've got a campaign very much uh, related to Israeli uh, dates right now um, that are coming in. So I'm selling the Mejul dates for Palestine. Maybe it's conflict of interest, but we have, uh, I may need to secure Dimitri's services soon because we have uh, put in a case to the Canadian Food Inspector agency around country of origin lacking on visual dates coming from Israel and settlements and you know there's campaign materials on how to go in and talk to your store owners like arts and and like uh, festival foods and uh, Al Quds Market even in Mississauga who are carrying these products that actually say Jordan on their shelves even though they're from Israeli settlements and from an Israeli company so 
yeah, lots yeah. of uh, different campaigns. But yeah, the unfortunate part is it's a lot of work to build that momentum and to try to uh, play a role. But sometimes it works like Air Canada and Bombardier too. So. Okay, Daniel. Thank you. Uh, we were talking about the culture boycott, I think, and uh, there are other groups in Toronto. It works with the culture boycott. We had a very successful campaign with SodaStream a couple of years ago, and we worked on uh, Will Packard. There's a couple of campaigns that eventually even targeted, for example, the Israeli Symphony, who played here in Toronto a couple of times. So there are other groups that we, that you, for example, people can search and they can check what kind of campaigns, because I do know that the BDS culture uh, part is still ongoing and they're still building on that. And uh, talking about uh, the education part, the one that Sue talked about, uh, yes, that we need to always to educate people because there is a number of people who do not know what, what's going on. Or, for example, they don't even turn on the TV. They don't want to listen to what's going on. So as an, people who are concerned, as a humanitarian, as an activist, it's always our concern to tell people what's going on. Just stop them in the street whenever we have a picket line and tell them the story. And this is where we attract people. The sincerity behind it, the passion that we have for the cause, is what attracts people to it. And uh, thank you. Dimitri? Uh, I'll start by just clarifying what the, PD, what the resolution actually says. The one that I brought forward initially simply called for the use of BDS to bring an end to the occupation. It didn't talk about the right of return. It didn't talk about equal rights for Palestinians living in Israel. Uh, and then uh, it was adopted over Elizabeth May's objections. She threatened to resign. We entered into this tortuous process of negotiating what was supposed to be a compromise. And what came out of it was a resolution that was far stronger in substance than what we had before. But it did not contain the dreaded acronym BDS. She was absolutely adamant that it could not have the acronym BDS. But it endorses all three tactics of the movement and endorses all three objectives of the movement including the right of return, whereas the first one didn't. The moment it was adopted, Elizabeth May had the party apparatus issue a press release which said that we had rejected the, the goals of the BDS movement. And anybody reading it could see that that was, that was antithetical to the truth. It was, absolutely, it was precisely the opposite of what we had done. Uh, many of us screamed bloody murder when that happened, and she issued uh, a statement which was, which was corrective, but at that point in time, the CBC and other mainstream media organizations had misreported what we had done. But if you read it, you can see very clearly it calls for an arms embargo on Israel, it calls for the International Criminal Court, you know, it, it just goes on and on, and it's a great resolution. She doesn't want to have anything to do with it, even though in the lead up to the vote in December 2016, she allowed the party uh, members of Shadow Cabinet to inform all the members that she supported the resolution, and it was ultimately adopted with over 90% support. You know, getting that to happen in the NDP is very difficult because the way you get resolutions to the floor in the NDP is quite different. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, and the Green is important for NDP activists to understand. In the Green Party, all you have, I mean, I don't know what the current status is. I quit the party because of this whole debacle with Elizabeth May. Uh, but uh, at the time, all you had to do with, to bring a resolution forward at convention was to get 20, you had to be a member in good standing for six months, okay? get 20 other members in good standing for six months to sponsor your resolution. Then it went to an online vote, and the, and the vote determined the priority of the resolution, how it would be handled at convention. So the members determined, in a transparent manner, how resolutions would be handled at convention. To this day, I still don't know exactly how the NDP goes about determining exactly how these Welcome things... The One thing I can tell from having participated in the last NDP convention in this big brouhaha over a very, very modest resolution simply calling for a ban on the importation of settlement products, which is a no-brainer, okay? One thing I do know is that the members don't determine whether or not those things get voted upon. They don't determine whether they even get debated, and that the leadership will pull out, you know, engage in all sorts of dirty tricks to avoid even having a debate on the subject. 30 seconds. And so that's exactly what happened in the NDP convention. I don't know how you overcome that other than, you know, pressuring people. And, and, and calling the leadership out for doing that. In terms of getting good candidates, as far as I know, there's only one, and you may, you may know more about this than I do, Barry, but there's only one current sitting MP who states openly that she supports BDS, and that's Nikki Ashton. Nobody else. Getting people within the NDP candidates to get to that level of courage that Nikki has demonstrated, I think the best way to do that is to cite to them these, these, these polling statistics that Barry talked about in some detail. 
and, and show them that this is a hugely popular policy. You know, the policy of sanctioning Israel is hugely popular and that they can gain a lot of support within the party and within the progressive movement by doing that. Uh, and the last thing I'll say is, you know, I'm hopeful that Sven Robinson will come out and declare uh, himself as being a supporter of BDS. He may have already done that. I follow him on Twitter. His commentary is about Palestine is great. Uh, you know, it would great, I think him joining uh, Nikki in Parliament would probably be a, a boost for the BDS movement within the NDP. Okay, so before Barry starts, I'll tell you exactly what happens in the NDP <laughs> when it comes to a resolution. They, 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 they decide to, you know, have their, have their meetings for it before they get into the floor. And then they, they, everybody comes in the room and, and, and the resolution on Palestine is brought to the meeting floor. And there's ten speakers and seven is in favor of the resolution to move it to the top so we can get talked and only three is against it. So they can see that the vote is going out on our way. So they get on their little radio phones or whatever the hell they got and they call all the bureaucrats and the staff and they rush the doors in time for the vote so they can feed them. That's what happens in the NDP. And I remember it personally. Okay, Barry. But that's not the official version. <laughs> <laughs> it's the real version, but not the That's the real, uh, the real unvarnished <laughs> truth. Uh, actually, uh, we came within 11 <laughs> votes in a room uh, packed with 400 delegates, a room designed to, for about half that number, standing room, packed shoulder to shoulder, and we fell short 11 votes in terms of bringing as a priority uh, that mild but uh, significant resolution to the, to the floor. And nonetheless, when the... Um, the counterfeit resolution came to the floor. Um, a hundred young people stood up in the middle of the convention and, and, and they formed a, like a line from one wall to the other. And they held up uh, pictures of the Palestinian young woman. Uh, Tamimi. Tamimi, that's right. Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the air was electric, it was absolutely electric. We defeated the counterfeit motion we just didn't have the power to bring the, um, the, the, the genuine motion to, uh, to the floor for debate. But I'll tell you something, it's going to happen. It's going to happen at the next convention. I've been predicting that. And we may even bring the resolution, uh, a solid pro-BDS Palestinian, pro-Palestinian resolution to the floor of the convention in, uh, in Ontario, the, uh, in Hamilton, in two weeks' time. Even though it's, uh, you know, it's not a provincial matter, but we say solidarity knows no boundaries. So we intend to bring it uh, forward. And Dimitri, you, you quit the Green Party. <laughs> you looking for a party to join? <laughs> I, am, I am a member of the NDP. Well, the NDP is a good start. But uh, I have another party in mind. I have another party in mind. Uh, and you know, uh, you'll be most welcome to join us. But the way, the way to win the NDP to this position just as we did uh, uh, win the NDP to a position of Canada out of Afghanistan, it was the Socialist Caucus that spearheaded that effort. And you, you, you want to you move the NDP to the left, you've got to be organized within it. And uh, the Socialist Caucus is, is one avenue to, uh, to pursue. Um, in the time remaining to me, I want to I thank Aurélien, our comrade from France, for his intervention. France, uh, the, the, the working class in France is strongly anti-Zionist. But you need to organize actions, and that's so correct, absolutely uh, a priority. Um, it, it, it's important that our sentiment, our majority sentiment, be manifested, that it be visible. And it's linked very much to the question of civil liberties. Here in Ontario, in Toronto, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the reprehensible Ford government at the provincial level and, and echoed by Tory at the Toronto level want to outlaw the Al Quds. Uh, uh, rally in March, uh, but we, we're going to do everything we can to uh, oppose that and to defend civil liberties. And so these questions are in, intimately linked. Uh, what would I ask Christian Freeland? I may get a chance to, you know, um, because there are a number of socialists that are seeking NDP nominations, yeah, not just in Vancouver Island or in uh, in in uh, the the the, uh, the main the South Mainland uh, in in Burnaby where one of our comrades is going to be seeking the nomination there. Okay, but Barry, we have a long list. Rosa. Your time is up. Ah, I would sorry. ask Christian Freeland, why does Canada have a direct military security alliance with Israel since we don't have common borders? 
And do you support Senator Frum's bill to make advocacy of BDS illegal? Thank you, Barry. Okay, so I have a long list and, and 